Okay, you all probably got a little pop up saying we were recording. Welcome, everybody. This is the first of our winter series of okay. uh, uh, the conservation team webinars for the Sierra Club of Pennsylvania chapter. Um, yes, uh, in case you didn't know, there are three or four other ones on the calendar. There's one tomorrow and uh, in early March, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so uh, just to put things in perspective, uh, the Pennsylvania chapter statewide organization has uh, eight um, conservation teams that kind of look at these issues uh, from a statewide point of view. And uh, we meet uh, regularly, either quarterly, bi-monthly, or even monthly um, to, to talk about these issues and support uh, local teams. And uh, organize, um, organize uh, educational events like this one. Uh, so today our speakers are going to be uh, Tamla Trussell from Move Past Plastics. Um, and she is an awesome, uh, uh, advocate and uh, activist in all of these uh, various climate action and uh, environmental issues. I encourage you to um, uh, connect with these other organizations as well. And also Dari Sitcher uh, is a food and ag team member of, of our um, food and agriculture team for the Sierra Club and a municipal sludge researcher. So with that, um, please like I said, please uh, keep your uh, audio on mute and um, feel free to enter questions in the chat. We will try to collect them and um, ask our. Oh, do me a favor and type in there. Ask we'll our um, uh, of this panelists to respond to them uh, okay. at the second half of this That's good to know. program. Okay. Go ahead, Tamala. Well, welcome everybody. I really want to um, thank Jim for inviting me in the Sierra Club to talk about this important issue of um, about where we can find PFAS in our life and a little bit about what we can do about it. I'm the founder of Move Past Plastic and we um, are dedicated to trying to basically move away from single use plastic, but we uh, deal with the entire life cycle of plastic from um, fracking all the way to waste management. Um, I attended a webinar on the National Academies of Science, Engineers, Medicine, and um, Health uh, a few months back, and they had these next couple of slides that I found to be particularly of importance. Um, basically, uh, chemical production is increased um, uh, uh, in 1945 to 2007, 15 fold. But since then, it's increased even more. That equates to 30,000 pounds per individual in the US every year. So um, if you look at this, there are 300. I had it and then I watched it. Known um, chemicals that are used or that are um, uh, created. Um, and used uh, in, in our country for various things. Very few of these, less than 30% are um, tested for uh, safety. And even a fraction of that is tested on the most vulnerable populations, um, uh, infants in the womb, infants and children. So because of this, this organization, the Stockholm Convention has said that we have surpassed the planetary boundaries of safe operating um, for humanity in the space of what they call novelty entities, which are um, pretty much uh, man-made chemicals that do not break down. These are petrochemicals, AKA, plastics and um, the chemicals used to make them and um, uh, ab get absorbed by them. You can see in this chart that the uh, 
production of chemicals has really increased from 2000 to 2017. And the red is the actual petrochemical plastic chemical production. And so you can see that is making up the majority of these chemicals that we are exposed to. The uh, amount of plastic um, it is going to increase uh, double in the next 10 years. And then again, it'll triple by 2050. The petrochemical industry, um, you know, we're moving to electric cars and energy efficient homes and they want a, a, a product for um, their, uh, you know, their source, their oil and gas, and that is plastic. There have been over 10,000 chemicals used in plastic, and the EU has identified 2,400 of these chemicals as um, uh, chemicals of concern because of their um, bioaccumulation and tox. Uh, a readiness to not break down in the environment, but to bioaccumulate and to build up. The Nordic Council of Ministers in 2017 um, uh, got a list of the ones that were deemed hazardous, but still used in plastic products. And there were 144 of them. You'll notice the big disparity between what um, our governing bodies label as a hazardous substance, and then the ones that scientists have uh, labeled as hazardous substances. Uh, from 144 chemicals that are hazardous but still used to the 2,400. This is a uh, tree diagram that is representing over 20 thousand different chemicals that were detected in a single piece of bioplastic. The industry is touting and pushing, you know, people are trying to make a lot of money with alternative biodegradable, compostable plastics, et cetera, et cetera. But they contain a lot of the same similar um, harmful chemicals. So you can find microplastics and uh, their toxic chemicals from the very basics, you know, of the food chain, from bacteria all the way up to small aquatic organisms and our fish, and then into into us, and um, along with the uh, the uh, these toxins will be, you know, heavy metals and um, you know many many chemicals of concern. Some of the health problems that they pose to us are, include, of course, cancer, birth defects, impaired immune function, diabetes, obesity, skin disease, deafness, vision, and many others um, as well. So let's move on to PFAS. PFAS are per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. What is that? Well, that is a chemical that was created by 3M around 1930, all right, and um, then and, and used by DuPont. And it, it has wonderful characteristics that we need for many products, such as resisting heat, oil, and water. This chemical um, is made of a carbon and a fluorine bond. That is the strongest bond in chemistry. Because of this, though, the chemical does not break down in the environment. It will last forever. Hence, it's also called a forever chemical. And so this chemical will persist in the environment and it is actually a part of our water cycle. And you can find it in our soil, our air, our water. So, where do we specifically, you know, where are these chemicals coming from and how are we getting in contact with them? So it's heavily used in the oil and gas industry. Think about it, that oil and gas, you know, you have, you're drilling a well and there's a lot of heat, oil and water. Same with, you know, needing protection for the pipelines and uh, other transportation. So the, just the entire life cycle 
for that. We find it collecting in our waste management, our landfills and our uh, wastewater treatment plants and bio sludge. Um, it's used on metal coatings, chemical manufacturing, and it's, as you can see, heavily in plastics, in the resin, the electronics industry, mining, and, and more. So one of the major contaminant sources that we'll run across is the aqueous film foaming foam. And um, that is used by firefighters all over the country. And so everywhere where, where they are practicing putting out fires, you will find this contamination. So a couple of places where that's found, um, in addition to just your local municipality and area, is at military bases and um, uh, at airports. Some other ways that you might uh, come into contact with this dangerous toxic chemical is through your everyday products that you can see here on this slide. Waterproof mascara, dental floss, your shoes, um, food packaging, fishing line, printer paper, ink, paint. Those are just some. 2,000 parts per trillion are allowed in plastic. Real quick, what the heck is a part per trillion? Is that a problem, 2,000? A part per trillion, one part per trillion is like equivalent to just a fraction of a grain of salt in an Olympic sized swimming pool. So not very much. So maybe that full grain of salt is in um, this, you know, this plastic, but guess what? One part per trillion is considered toxic according to the new EPA's health advisory. So there's um, loopholes in any of the laws that we have, which we're just getting some food packaging laws uh, put in. The um, amounts that can be can be put in, um, you can see over here on the right, but um, that's intentional PFAS. But then there's unintentional PFAS because when plastic and these packaging products are being manufactured, they go through extruders under intense heat and pressure. And to keep those machines from gunking up, they use PFAS. So PFAS will unintentionally get on plastic and our uh, food packaging. You can also find PFAS heavily used on tires and artificial turf. In fact, it's extremely hazardous for um, our youth playing on this artificial turf. Not only does it get you know, up to 50 degrees hotter and can cause them to have third degree burns, but it, you can also find um, that the CDC has said it's the se uh, seventh um, most prevalent way that youth are exposed to toxic lead. Heavy metals and plastic kind of go hand in hand because it's used to make them um, you know, have their uh, stiffness or then their softness actually. So um, this is a map of one spot where I live. You can see the surrounding um, homes where they are um, making, I, I can't remember if it's like uh, computer chips or something, so, something technological. And this area may or may not have PFAS contamination, we, we don't know. But these kind of places are in everybody's community and there are maps where you can locate this. But there are also legacy industries. This was a tire and rubber factory in my hometown. Um, and there was a carpet factory. They took their remnants of uh, tire pieces and carpet pieces and put them in this legacy landfill. There are no maps for these legacy industries and landfills that can contain possible sources of contamination for you. Notice in the lower left corner, 
you see a primary tributary that's going to the bottom of the screen, entering Conodiguinic Creek. This creek is a water source, drinking water source, for about 25 municipalities along the creek. And you can guarantee, I have yet to get someone to tell me um, if they tested for PFAS, but it's something that I pushed um, DEP to do, um, but it's most 100% likely going to be full of PFAS because of the material contained in it. I, I've named this creek Ferris Moneris because it's eating the um, uh, uh, leachate coming out of there in an anaerobic state and that's what the iron oxidizing bacteria is doing and looks like. So to review, some of the PFAS sources come from the industry and of course chemical producers and industry and heavily used with the aqueous film foaming foam, which is used in our military bases, airports, and of course our communities. The oil and gas industry and all parts of it. Then you have collections over to the left from your landfills, your wastewater plants, um, which you know then become bio sludge and get spread on farm fields. And of course we incinerate a lot of um, these, you know, electronic waste that doesn't get recycled in plastics too. So some of the animal studies have shown liver, testicular, and pancreatic cancers, mammary gland tumors, altered breast development, and it even depresses our immunotoxicity. So we aren't as um, COVID vaccines, you know, aren't as effective. And the changes in blood serum lipids, which means, you know, we're prone to high cholesterol. There have been um, numerous, many um, human studies that are epidemiological studies. Um, several were done, one of the largest of 69,000 people that showed this correlation between these diseases and PFOS um, in 2000 with a lawsuit with DuPont um, over uh, um, um, a farmer who had his cows um, very, 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 very sick. And uh, there's a movie about that. So plastics and chemicals have crossed over to the unseen. They are crossing the placental barrier, the blood brain barrier. And you can find them in a fetal heart, brain, lungs, liver, and kidneys. You can find them in breast milk and in bottled milk. So there's not a cure for the treatment of these toxic um, chemicals and uh, pieces of plastic in us. So the only thing that we can do is let's try to prevent it. So I'm going to go over some ways that we can do that. One, you can get um, find out if your municipality is testing their drinking water for PFAS. And if they are, what are those maximum contamination levels? Does your state have any um, regulations um, in place? You can filter your water with an NSF P473, um, 473. 30% uh, uh, of the dust in our, um, our uh, home is uh, plastic and the chemicals with it. So keep your home clean. Um, I wouldn't recommend having, you know, a lot of carpet and a, a lot of uh, plastic polyester fuzzy things around your house. Eat fresh, eat local, and then look for products that are PFOS free um, or a term PFC free. So that's kind of jargon that you'll look for, PFOS-free, PFC-free, um, and DWR is durable water repellent. You don't want, you know, that on there. Oh, my slide is jammed, come on.
Okay, there we go. There is a map. Um, there are a couple of maps that will help you locate known and suspected um, sites for PFOS contamination that are polluting drinking water. The Environmental Working Group is one of those source maps. So, um, like I said, go ahead and uh, get a filter for your water. Um, Brita filter is not a NSFP473 filter. So um, look for those PFOS free products in personal care and your cookware. Um, understand that pesticides and fertilizers and even your bags of um, soil from your store can contain these toxic chemicals um, in the clothing that you buy. So a dental floss and waterproof mascara and lipstick um, contains PFOS. There are products I, um, in fact, just getting ready for this presentation, put on some makeup and I found an EWG uh, symbol that's, you know, said that, you know, this product was safe. Um, so look for, look for those. You'll, like I said, you will find um, PFOS in your products that are your pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and even road de-icer um, that are still on the shelf. This product, Home Depot and Lowe's, I think have now stopped um, carrying this product. But if you can buy fresh, buy local, and if you can afford it, buy organic, at least for the vegetables that use, or, you know, the, that are heavily you know, used with pesticides and um, fungicides and stuff, um, and try to buy products not wrapped in plastic. That is not Oh, you know, it's very difficult to do. This is my cart and you can see my mushrooms are in plastic. I've got a plastic bag of frozen vegetables and I've got potatoes in plastic and my bread, you know, but I've, I've done my best and, you know, we work on it. So I want to show you just real quick with some apparel. This is um, some scorecards and uh, I have some resources at the end to help you with, you know, locating PFOS free products. And um, so these are how our retailers are scoring for right now. Um, Under Armour, Gap and Adidas, it's found that more than two thirds of the sports bras and a quarter of the leggings contain fluorinated um, uh, chemicals, which are indicators or of PFAS. Um, they've even been found in infant socks. So here um, is a scorecard for shoes and sportswear. Um, raincoats, snow boots, uh, um, bicycle oil, ski wax all contain um, PFAS. Think about anything that's going to prevent water, oil, and um, uh, heat, right? Your, your, the phone on your screen even has PFAS. So um, this area, the, uh, the outdoor world is, is kind of sorely lacking. Patagonia is trying to work on it, and um, they're making the most gains so far. Um, there are alternatives for these things, so you can look. You can look for them. Everything here is hyperlinked, and um, I've let Jim uh, share the PowerPoint slides, so you guys can have access to that. Um, so, what about indoor apparel? So, Levi Strauss. I watched a webinar with them, and they are doing absolutely amazing work because they're going back all the way through their entire <laughs> supply chain and have come up with alternative products and um it's they're just doing fantastic and they've set a good um model and system and a way of doing it that absolutely every apparel brand could follow and so we could encourage that to happen by our purchases and by writing to them and to our legislators. So 
your prevention strategies, once again, test in, for your water, filter it, clean your house, buy um, fresh, local, if you can, um, organic, and look for PFAS free or PFC free products. If you wanna make a bigger impact than just your personal life, um, but to help all of us as a whole and our children coming um, forward for the future, we need to ban the entire class of PFAS because um, regulations are just zoning in currently with states on one to six PFAS, but there are up to 12,000 PFAS depending on the definition. And um, you can support the Break Free from Pollution Federal Act. Uh, you can, um, we can establish uh, wide scale human biomonitoring for these chemicals. The US is one of the only people who hasn't joined the Basel Convention, which is um, uh, a way to regulate shipping waste to third world countries who don't have the infrastructure, which that's what we were doing and we still are. There's a big illegal market for, uh, for plastics actually, um, and support the UN Global Plastic Treaty. Um, some of the things that we want to look for with our legislation is to include blood testing and health monitoring, test other sources than drinking water, ban frac fluid um, used as de-icers on roads, test and monitor wastewater and biosludge before spreading it onto our farm fields, test and monitor leachate before taking it to the wastewater treatment plant, and most importantly, we need to hold the polluters, 3M, now Kimor, no longer DuPont, accountable for cleaning up and stopping this. If you want more information on this, Move Past Plastic has several initiatives. We're trying to get every municipality to test their drinking water and um, to support these strong legislation and to compile all this data so that we get um, you know, more science and stronger legislation. So that is all I have. You have a list of resources here and um, Doreen will be going over um, this life cycle of uh, PFAS in our um, uh, wastewater and our bio sludge and uh, giving you some uh, real world examples. So I thank you so much. All right, thank you, Tamala. That, that was great. Uh, there are a couple of questions uh, in the in the chat, which we'll hold until we get uh, we'll get through uh, Derry's presentation. Um, I am supposed to be running hers, and here we go. Okay, you're up, Derry. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, so, as you see, <clears throat> PFAS as a compost, and I have in quotes as a contamination vehicle. Also, how did we get PFAS in to your food and water? Okay, next slide, please, please. <clears throat> so I'm gonna give an overview of what sewage sludge is and how it works, because that is really the learning process to how it gets into our food. Um, so sewage sludge is everything that goes down the drain of homes, industry, business, hospital, to your wastewater treatment plant. At the wastewater treatment plant, they heat it, they add more chemicals and then they squeeze it in an effort to um, clean the water to release back into the community. Um, the solid product that's remaining is sewage sludge or biosolids. They're the same thing. And I'll talk more about that in a bit. The wastewater treatment plant treats the waste with the goal of releasing it back into the community. <coughs> it's not the function to create um, fertilizer. Um, the cleaner the water is that they're releasing back in the community, the more contaminated the sewage sludge is. Um, over 8 million tons or 60% of our municipal sewage waste is applied as a fertilizer um, to farmlands or also um, uh, applied to parks, playgrounds, uh, golf courses, um, and bagged fertilizer. Um, the reason for this is that there's a measurable amount of nitrogen and phosphorus. 
nitrogen and phosphorus makes things grow. And that's why it's considered a fertilizer. Um, there's thousands of chemicals, pathogens, heavy metals, pharmaceuticals, bacteria, but the EPA only regulates uh, nine heavy metals and two indicator bacteria. There's no proof that the sewage sludge or biosolids product is safe, but there's a lot of proof that it is in fact a source of contamination. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, whoops. Uh, there we go. Um, so this is a, uh, represents some of the chemicals and contaminants that are found in sewage sludge. Um, in red, you'll see the only contaminants that are federally required for testing by the EPA are nine heavy metals. They're in red. Arsenic, cadmium, copper, lead, mercury, molybdenum, nickel, selenium, zinc, and two indicator bacteria, E. coli and salmonella. Um, class A, class B, and exceptional quality or EQ are just grades of the sewage sludge waste. Um, by national standards or national EPA requirements, class B sewage sludge has to be um, permitted to be applied to landscapes. Um, and if it passes the nine heavy metals, meaning that if the heavy metals level is low enough, um, it can be land applied. Um, and as you see, Lots of other things going on here. There's no uh, need to test for pharmaceuticals. There's no need to test for chemicals like PFAS. Um, and the only difference between class A and exceptional quality in class B is if it's showing uh, the indicator bacteria of E. coli or salmonella. If, that, if it's not showing that at the time they test, it's considered a class A or class B. Um, even though studies show regrowth of that bacteria within um, 30 minutes. Um, this is what your bag fertilizers are often applied for, for instance, to um, um, uh, lawn, lawn fertilizing. Um, and um, keep in mind that every state has made very much stricter regulations about um, PFAS levels in their sewage sludge waste. Um, next slide, please. We're stuck. I, I think you see it, Gary. <laughs> it's it's the map. Oh, okay. I don't know that. Sure. Yeah. Um, okay. So I will. I will. Even though I don't see it, I will continue to speak like I do. <laughs> um, so this is a map of the. Chesapeake Bay watershed area. Um, and, and recognizing that uh, watershed contamination is far reaching. Um, the Chesapeake Bay watershed, um, which uh, provides water to 18.1 million people living along the watershed area, um, also includes parts of six states. Um, contamination of water supply from sewage sludge waste um, is a concern not only for the area and the land where the runoff is, but also um, for the direct deposit of the sewage treatment plant effluences in the, um, in the waterways or used as irrigation supplies. Um, note how much of Pennsylvania, which is represented in the blue area, um, is in the um, Chesapeake Bay watershed area. Um, and um, take special note at the bottom of Pennsylvania on the Maryland border, because I'll talk about that later. Um, so um, next slide, please. Okay. I see the next slide that says PFAS contaminants of emerging concern. Do you see that, Tamala? There we go. Thank you. Okay, okay so we're at PFAS. Um, now, Tamala covered um, quite a few of the, a lot of this information. Um, so I'll just kind of top it off with um, these, these chemicals have, were created by 3M after World War II. Um, the toxicity was known then, it's not a surprise. So for it to be called emerging concern um, is, is in my mind false and misleading. They know that it causes um, birth defects, uh, affects the endocrine system. Um, and there are thousands of types of PFAS and each one has a distinctive molecular structure 
So they, they, they require distinctive um, testing. So that's the tough thing. You can't just say, hey, test for PFAS because there's thousands. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, emerging concern, but not new. Um, both industry and government have recognized that and been testing for PFAS for years. DuPont lost a huge legal battle um, over PFAS and both the sludge industry and our government has been monitoring and recognizing this for years. Why is it called a forever chemical? Because it doesn't break down in the environment and it bioaccumulates, it builds up in our soil and our water, the plants and animals that we consume and in our human bodies. Next slide, please. So why is sewage sludge a big deal? Um, it contaminates, it's a vehicle of contamination for your food and water, no matter where you live. It, if you're getting your vegetables from California, they're contaminated. If it, it's, it's a vehicle for contamination. It impacts the health of the children and the neighbors and the workers where it's being spread. It's social justice implications for communities because um, a community doesn't have the right to say no. It doesn't matter if you say no, that's where it's gonna be put. Um, it's financial implication for the homeowner. I've worked with lots of people who've said, now, now what am, how am I gonna sell my house? They're spreading this stuff around my house. Um, and, and of course the long-term soil contamination. So um, even if a, a farm stops using it, um, the, the soil is contaminated. Um, next slide, please. So um, this is a just a, snapshot of, of how farmers are finding PFAS from sewage sludge and biosolids and irrigation um, in, the, in our, um, their product and our, our food supply. Um, for 20 years, um, Fred Stone in Maine uh, used what was guaranteed to be safe. And I'll be talking more about him in another slide or so, but the PFAS levels uh, in his animals once discovered were, were off the charts. Um, Art Schaap in New Mexico, dairy farmer, thousand cows because of the extreme levels of PFAS. Now his water supply was contaminated by a military base. Um, the Minnetucci farm in Colorado closed um, after PFAS was found in their irrigation supply. Um, and, and noting that, um, it wasn't just the animals that were contamination, garlic, spinach, carrots, all, everything because of the irrigation. Um, toxic chemicals in Wisconsin um, halted the application of farms and um, independent studies, for instance, in, in Massachusetts, cranberries were rejected by Ocean Spray um, after they've started independent testing. So that's also something to pay attention to. Now, food companies are saying, look, we're gonna have to test before we accept your product. Um, next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> um, so I've, I've worked with Fred Stone. Uh, he, he lives outside of Kennebunk Ken Court, uh, Maine. Um, Fred and his, uh, has a family farm. Um, it's a family farm for over a hundred years um, in an effort to improve the soil quality for grazing and growing foods. Um, Fred was accepting sewage sludge waste that was guaranteed safe from Kennebunk Court. He followed the rules, kept strict records, and applied from 1983 to 2004. Um, the, and the last time that Fred used sewage sludge was in 2004, so 19 years ago. Um, and um, PFAS was discovered on his farm because the water downstream, the water of Kennebunk Court, suddenly was showing high amounts of PFAS. They traced it back to his farm, which accepted their sewage sludge. And only the farm fields that applied sewage sludge had PFAS. His farm fields that he didn't use sewage sludge had became um, contaminated and his family became contaminated. Um, there's no testing requirements for um, PFAS in sludge, food or water. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so we're going to take a quick peek at the following slides from the Water Environmental Federation. 
their 2019 webinar called PFAS, Wastewater and Biosolids Management. Um, these are important because the Water Environmental Federation, or WEF, is the industry's organization that manages sewage waste and lobbies for wastewater industry. Their work's important because without it, their professional knowledge. What is problematic is WEF's organizational influence that ensures that regulations do not impact their business model. This is what I have a problem with. For instance, when new um, WEF's web website encouraged their members to contact legislators to vote against any PFAS re regulations. So their hands aren't clean, even though they deal with sewage. Next uh, slide, please. <clears throat> um, so the industry's webinar about PFAS contamination found that drinking water also um, is recognized as a path for contamination, but also airborne. Um, WEF recognized that PFAS is a problem and it, that it transfers into our food, water, and communities um, via water and sewage, sludge, and biosolids. What is important is to remember that if you don't test for it, you don't find it. I would encourage everybody to consider the scope of the waste that can legally be deposited at wastewater treatment plants to be treated. And I say that with air quotes. For instance, Pennsylvania was taking their fracking flow back to wastewater treatment plants that were then applying um, sewage sludge to permitted farms. Um, again, think about what's required testing, nine heavy metals, two indicator bacteria. Next slide, please. <clears throat> wow, look at this. Um, West presentation, they listed the known PFAS levels found in Michigan's water supply in 2014 with an eye on whether they could meet um, or cannot meet the parts per thousand, sorry, noted, and they noted that they can't. They cannot meet Maine's new standard either, but they are happy to report that they can meet New York's higher numbers of parts per thousand, the PPT. In a numbers game, it's not about creating a safe standard, it's about meeting the number. And that's, that's the challenge here. Next slide, please. Um, now here, WEF lists the bag fertilizer companies that they're testing that uh, include companies that do not use sewage sludge as a base. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, the PFAS contamination fertilizer is known whether it's used on farm fields that grow our foods or sold as bag fertilizer for home gardeners. Next slide, please. Um, look at the contamination of malorganite product. It's off the charts. Malorganite is just sewage sludge biosolids waste from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, a city of just over a half a million people. But it's a great marketing plan to dispose of sewage sludge waste and get people to pay for it. Um, you can see that bit, like Bay State Fertilizer, for instance, is Maine's version of um, how do we move sewage waste into bag fertilizer. And, and note the much smaller levels of um, non-biosolids based uh, fertilizers. Um, next slide, please. Um, so the Sierra Club offers grassroots teams as a way to add focus to our environmental interests. And the Sierra Club grassroots wastewater residuals team has also done an excellent study on what bag fertilizers are sludge based. Um, here's their study link. And um, you don't, don't, don't worry about recording this down. Um, you can find it on the web and we will be um, having this presentation on the Pennsylvania uh, Sierra Club website. So you can check back in for specifics, but you can also just Google um, Sierra Club um, PFAS uh, bag fertilizer test. Next slide, please. So EPA and FDA, where are you? EPA is the federal bureaucratic agency responsible for regulating sewage sludge waste. And it recognizes that the regulations don't protect human health. The FDA admitted that PFAS is contaminating our food and water, and they recognize sewage sludge as a vehicle. When they only offer health advisories, it's just that, it's an advisory. It's not a law and a rule, and it has no teeth to stop the, the, the use of, of sewage sludge as a fertilizer or lawn application or bag fertilizer. So it is too late to test for PFAS once it's on your dinner table. Um, 
it's up to our bureaucracy to get in front of this, not behind it. Next slide, please. Um, so in September of 2022, with funding from the Pennsylvania Sierra Club, our ag team participated in um, a testing that we call PFAS and PA Farms study. Um, a kind of a buckshot investigation of farms and farm products in various parts of Pennsylvania. Um, we tested a tomato, a potato, milk, corn stalk, fungi, and a soil sample, all from various locations. Some products like the tomato and potato were purchased from a roadside stand, and we, we found no PFAS in those samples. So that was, um, that, that was heartening to, to know that it's not so endemic. Um, the milk was purchased from an established dairy business, and the soil, corn stalk, and fungi samples were taken from farmland that is permitted by the PADEP to spread um, sewage sludge biosolids. This slide is a copy of the final PFAS test results of the soil testing sample that was taken from the farm that's permitted to land apply sewage sludge biosolids. Um, and this was in Fawn, um, excuse me, Fawn Grove in York County. Um, the sample shows various PFAS chemicals in the soil, as well as the fungi and corn stalk, all from the same location. So that's why I wanted to point out, do you remember um, the Chesapeake watershed uh, map and York County is on that um, Maryland border and within the, um, within the Chesapeake watershed. Um, next slide, please. Um, the PFAS chemicals um, found these in these test, uh, testing samples, sorry, testing samples are, are of the blue color you might wonder why we tested corn stalk and not corn. Um, and this is field corn meant for animals. Um, previous studies showed that less PFAS is actually in that animal feed corn, but corn stalk is, is used as silage. It's still used as an animal feed. Um, so if you're mixing that in with the corn, um, the silage, uh, and the animals are consuming that. Here we see that the corn stalk is in fact picking up PFAS from the soil where the sewage sludge has been applied. Um, we were fortunate to find fungi growing because there's a large body of our work that shows that fungi is, are absorbing chemicals and contaminants. And our PFAS test um, seems to agree with that finding. Um, remember that PFAS is bioaccumulative, meaning it builds up bit by bit. So pretending that a small amount won't hurt you is false and misleading. Um, this, these tests were uh, from an area in Fawn Grove in York County, um, and the farmland that is permitted to spread the sewage sludge biosolids completely surrounds the local school. So the children are exposed to the airborne contaminants every day, um, as well as the potential contamination of their community water supply. Um, separately from the Sierra Club, I did test a local creek that runs through that sludged area and that also tested positive with PFAS. Uh, next sample, side, excuse me, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, this is the sampling of the milk test from a dairy in Berks County in Valley, Pennsylvania. Um, although we don't know if the fields where the cows are grazing is top dressed with sewage sludge biosolage or where the cows food and water is coming from, we do know that the fields in the area are spread with sewage sludge mixed with kill floor, kill floor butchering waste from the Hatfield slaughter facilities. This is why that community asked, asked me to give some um, insight because the smell of rotting flesh was a distraction. Um, the term top dressing is when they spread sewage sludge on the fields intended for grazing to boost the growth, growth of the plants because of the nitrogen and phosphorus. Um, so we note that the slides from WEF um, webinar did recognize air deposition was the way they fr framed it as a way for PFAS contamination. So just like Fred Stone in Maine, yes, there is likely PFAS in your food, meat and dairy. Um, we will be posting the complete um, test results of our PFAS and PA farm uh, study on the Pennsylvania Sierra Club website. Next, please. And um, so this is a map of Pennsylvania. The green dots represent where class B sewage sludge biosolids are permitted to be spread. Now each dot is not necessarily a farm, each dot, dot is a permit. So the permits can have um, multiple um, farms or multiple acreage. Um, 
So that's how Pennsylvania tracks class B biosolids being spread. Um, Pennsylvania accepts waste from our neighboring five states, as well as locations as far away as Canada. So apparently Canada has nowhere to spread their sludge. I don't know. I talked to Can Canadians. Mm -hmm. um, so remember class A and exceptional quality or EQ uh, sewage biosolids, there's no permitting needed. And there's no way to track if there's a source of contamination. Class A and exceptional quality is your bag fertilizers that you buy at the store um, or put on playgrounds or um, used as um, lawn fertilizers. So you'll definitely want to start paying attention to that since it's time to start your seedling. Um, next slide. And um, so who says no? Um, Pennsylvania Sierra Club, um, the National Sierra Club. Um, Pennsylvania Sierra Club has a, has a um, policy uh, opposed to sewage sludge waste. Um, but there are some other groups uh, like Pennsylvania Farmers Union, Organic Consumers Association, Environmental Working Group. Um, so aside from if you're not a Pennsylvania, a member of the Pennsylvania Sierra Club, please join, get involved, but also start pressuring um, organizations that you think should care about this. Um, and it's going to boil down to pressuring the legislators. So that's, that's what I got for you, folks. Um, okay, back to you, Jim. Thank you for your time. All right, thank you so both, much. Tamala and uh, Dari, for excellent presentations. I failed to introduce myself at the beginning. Uh, I'm Jim Wiley. I'm the vice chair of the Pennsylvania uh, Sierra Club chapter. And I also, at this time, want to introduce Kareem, who is a member of our Zero Waste uh, team. and. Uh, I'll, I'll start with, um, Corrine, did you have any uh, uh, questions from the chat you wanna start us with? Uh, I have a couple of comments I'd like to start us with. And that is, um, I just wanna encourage everybody to go to the chat because some questions were asked and some answers were given. Uh, there's a helpful link to the UN uh, information that somebody asked about. Uh, a question was asked actually by me because um, what was listed was how uh, we should encourage our municipal governments to do testing for PFAS, uh, but what could we do as individuals? Uh, sometimes uh, we want to know more quickly than the, the wheels spin within our municipal governments. So someone listed that there is a test uh, that has a fee of $75. So go to the chat and see that um, some people ask questions and some people got answers right there that's available for you. Um, in terms of the Zero Waste Committee, um, we are a, a Pennsylvania-wide group. Uh, people are looking into what's going on in their municipalities and sharing success stories as well as frustrations and um, educating one another about how we can move forward uh, with PFAS and other pressing issues around waste and contamination, recycling and the mythology of uh, recycling. Um, so that's about it in terms of what I see. Uh, anybody else uh, have questions that they feel uh, they Tamla, don't have an answer Tamla, to Tamla, that they would like? Want to respond to anything that you see? Um, there was a question about um, nature's promise. If you're USDA, if you're organic, you cannot use sewage sludge as a as a fertilizer. Um, so that is a value with organics. Um, that's also a value if you are buying local. Um, you can uh, check in with that farm and ask, you know, are you guys using uh, biosolids or sewage sludge waste? Um, and uh, and if they are, I'd say. Um, do a little printout of, of um, how things have been contaminated and, and try to dissuade your, your local farmer. I've, I've worked with people who've had success just because it's neighbors talking to neighbors and coming in first with the, with the olive branch instead of the stick. Um, you know, I've had farmers say, I used to use it until, until my community helped me understand it. Um, so I, I would answer that. Um, organic foods um, are not allowed to use sewage sludge. Um, and there was a question about farm spreading in Pennsylvania. Yes, definitely. The map of Pennsylvania that we had um, 
And all that information came from the Pennsylvania DEP. Um, every state can make a different law about how sewage sludge is used. Um, Maine, for instance, has absolutely tightened their regulations on testing for PFAS in sewage sludge. Uh, and um, uh, Pennsylvania could do the same if they were so inclined, which they have not. Tamla, can you respond to the question about are there alternatives to, uh, to like Teflon and, and stuff like that, that we use our complicated plastics for? Yeah, so I know um, for sure there's um, alternatives for class B uh, aqueous uh, film foaming foam, but for um, your products uh, such as cookware, yes, of course you've got your traditional iron skillet, but they um, do have some other alternatives. Um, you know that that help with with a non-stick um, out there and is being marketed, but you have to be careful with them because sometimes the replacements are you know just as bad. Um, so if you go to um, the link that I have uh, provided for uh, PFAS-free products, that will guide you to like specific. Um, brands that you can go to for cookware and your apparel wear and makeup, personal care and everything like that. Yeah. I do just want to make one quick comment back with the um, organics. So yes, people who are farming organically, um, you know, cannot put that bio sludge down. However, I know that the farm fields that most all of them are farming on. Um, I guess I have a young couple who uh, are organic farmers and they were farming for seven years and they learned about PFAS, had their soil tested only to find out that it was severely, severely contaminated, even though they've been doing all the right things for seven years, be just because of legacy um, bio sludge being put down. But that said, at least no more in addition are being put down, um, uh, you know, in spite of just the rain raining on it <laughs> with PFAS. But um, uh, yeah, so. All right, I see Carol and I see Joan have their hands raised, but I want to um, just quickly finish up um, the slides that I have. And, and then stop the recording and then we can talk for as long as we, as we want to. Um, so just to wrap up, I wanted to point people to the uh, Sierra Club uh, Pennsylvania Conservation Teams that you can find in the top menu of the uh, Sierra Club Pennsylvania and find your local group there. There's a map that we're organized into regional groups. Uh, and there we have uh, today's speakers. Thank you very much. Um, I will follow up with an email to everybody that registered with the recording and presentations. You don't need to take notes if you were. Um, and uh, our teams, uh, the food and ag team is meeting on Monday and the zero waste team is meeting uh, tomorrow night. And I'll, I'll be sure to include uh, uh, links to how to join those meetings. And, and thank you for that. And with that, um, thank you to our speakers. Tamala and Dari, and I'm going to try to find the stop recording. <laughs>